Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we are thrilled to uh, be here in person as opposed to being um, virtual. My name is uh, Nina Gardner. I teach uh, corporate sustainability, business, and human rights here at uh, Johns Hopkins SICE. And uh, it is my distinct honor to have a fantastic uh, panelist here, um, one uh, Ann Cody, who's at the State Department, and, um, and Kevin Cassidy, who's the ILO representative here in DC. A few words of their bio, um, and then we'll get into uh, some remarks and Q&A. And I really hope um, we will have uh, an active audience participation. Um, first of whom will be Aditya Misra, one of my students who has actually done a podcast on uh, the game, uh, the World Cup, Qatar, and some of his uh, misgivings about what was happening there. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our, our panelists. We're very lucky because uh, they both complement each other very well. Ann Cody is senior advisor at the uh, Office of Multilateral and Global Affairs at the Department of Labor and Human Rights at the State Department. And uh, she splits her time between sports and human rights, which is a thing, um, and multilateral affairs. And uh, prior to this assignment, she has led the International Disability Rights Team, bilateral and multilateral engagement globally to combat discrimination and abuse against persons with disabilities. And. Um, Prior to joining the State Department, she oversaw the Washington office of Blaze Sports America, where she shaped the organization's policy efforts and helped lead its international diplomacy and development initiatives. And you did a lot of government affairs uh, on these issues. Um, and she also worked in several capacities with the 1996 Atlanta Paralympic Organizing Committee. So I mean, she, she knows something about Paralympics and Olympics, so the real thing. And talking about the real thing, She's a Paralympic gold medalist. Um, I found out it's not, uh, so you, you competed in uh, wheelchair basketball, but also just a single, um, the, what do you call it, the long wheelchair racing, wheelchair racing where she won her gold medal. Um, this is fantastic. And you've actually, uh, the recipient of Paralympic Order, which is the highest honor bestowed uh, by the International Paralympic Committee. So this is for your contributions to Olympic and Paralympic sport in the US. And you hold a Bachelor of Fine Arts um, and Master of Science degree from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So welcome, Anne. It's, we're very happy to see you. And you said this is one of the first times you've come out of vir virtual Zoom land to, yeah. to be here. So thank you very much. Uh, Kevin Cassidy is our ILO man in DC. Um, and is, um, has been in, in this world for many, many years. Uh, you were at Senior Con Communications and Economic Social Affairs Officers for ILO, uh, 11 years at the ILO at the United Nations. So New Yorker, you are a New Yorker. Staten Island, yay, okay, which is where uh, Amazon's trying to unionize. <laughs> and um, you've worked with uh, member states uh, and heads of government at the ministerial level highlighting decent work, which is, of course, what the ILO is a lot about. Um, and you were, before this, you were t chief technical advisor at the ILO's global campaign on promoting fundamental rights of work. We'll be talking about that. And um, part of the ILO, you worked with the Aga Khan Foundation. I found that very interesting, uh, focusing on rural and community-based development in Central and South Asia. So this links to what we'll be talking about today. Um, and you've also worked um, among many parts of the UN, but also with, in the executive office of the Secretary General. So you work with Boutrous Ghali and Ban Ki-moon, correct? And we won't hold this against you, but he did get a master's at SIPA at Columbia. So we're making, we'll, we'll, we'll. <laughs> So um, we're here to, today to talk about multi-stakeholder, uh, multi-stakeholder, no, multi mega sporting events. Sorry, I talk about multi-stakeholder initiatives so much in my class, but um, uh, mega sporting events and Qatar. And I was alerted to this issue for the first time about seven years ago when there was a panel organized by the International Bar Association and Human Rights Watch. Because before, this was not on my radar. And I remember returning to my office and uh, changing my syllabus immediately 
and adding multi -spo uh, sporting event, mega sporting events to the curriculum because I thought that was a, a extremely important issue that we had not been uh, really um, looking at. So today we're going to have a conversation about Qatar and beyond with our distinguished guests and our student commentator, Aditya Misra. Um, we need to remember that human rights challenges are tied to multi-stakeholder, to mega sporting events, certainly did not start with Qatar. And um, these challenges have been a real issue for the associations um, when we are make, doing these events in non-Western countries, but also in the regular countries, European countries. So let's look at the kinds of human rights issues and challenges that all host countries have to deal with. So one of them being forced evictions without due process and compensation. We saw a lot of that in Sochi, in Rio, and in Beijing, but it goes way back when you're building these stadia, right? Abuse and exploitation of migrant workers in the construction of infrastructure. This has been happening everywhere. Qatar made us focus on the issue, but this is happening has been happening a lot uh, in other um, venues. The silencing of civil society and rights activists, and that was Sochi and the Beijing Olympics brought that to the fore. Um, threats, intimidation, and arrests of journalists. Again, Sochi and Beijing was um, a, a big one on that. Lack of LGBT rights and protections, we saw that. Uh, that I think I started focusing on that mostly for um, with, with Sochi but that uh, certainly was in the uh, foreground for Qatar, or Qatar. Um, and equal access for women to participate and attend sports events, that's another big issue. And something that we tend to forget is sweats sweatshop conditions in the merchandising uh, in the supply chain. So, you know, all of those sort of things that you buy, who made them, where there's child labor involved, et cetera. So these are sort of the, the general basket of human rights challenges for mega sporting events. Um, few people have been aware of how much FIFA's 2010 decision to award Russia and Qatar the World Cup venues helped shine a light on the underlying corruption scandals that have been dogging FIFA for years. And that sort of helped create a new sports and human rights ecosystem. We will be talking about that. A few examples, I um, have to mention John Ruggie, because John Ruggie is someone who is very important in my class on business and human rights, because he's the father of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And he was asked by um, FIFA, which was definitely in need of a reputational overhaul, uh, to do an in-depth analysis of how FIFA needed to manage the far-reaching human rights um, challenges associated with its activities and relationships. The report entitled For the Game, For the World was published in 2016. It required reading from my students, but it's worth Googling to, to, to read it. One of the many suggestions was to embed respect for human rights in, its, in, in FIFA's daily actions and decision making and to integrate human rights requirements into the bidding documents for the next World Cup, which ended up being the 2026 Men's World Cup. So in fact, Qatar is the last World Cup whose venue was selected under the old rules. You should be aware of that. So the US, Mexico, Canada bid was won under the new more stringent guidelines. So hopefully we'll be seeing less of what we saw. Uh, FIFA also uh, created Human Rights Advo Advisory Board and some of Ruggie's um, excellent colleagues joined it. 2016, the Sporting Chance Principles on Human Rights uh, in Mega Sporting Events was created. I think you'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, the Center for Human Rights, Sports and Human Rights was launched in 2018. Mary Robinson was the founding patron, and Mary Harvey is a chief executive. She's fantastic. And the former ILO chief, Guy Ryder, joined as um, patron. a patron in 2022. Um, Human Rights Watch has been extremely vocal on mega sporting events from the very beginning. And the Doha Dialogues were created for candid stock taking by Qatar and other international partners to address human rights risks and implement labor reforms in the context of the first FIFA World Cup in the Middle East. So with this brief overview, let's start the conversation uh, with our guests on uh, these kinds of events in the latest World Cup where, according to The Guardian, an estimate of 6,500 migrant workers died preparing 
the $2,200 billion infrastructure for an event that lasted three and a half weeks, although we were saying much of the infrastructure was also subways and, 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 and so was not just the eight stadia. Um, but uh, it, I must admit, it put a, a damper on my excitement in watching the World Cup, which was truly exciting, um, but it put a damper on, and sort of I felt guilty uh, watching these matches. So uh, without further ado, maybe we'll start with Anne, a few, a few minutes of comments, and then Kevin, and then we'll get into the Thank you so much, Nina. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm pleased to be representing the U.S. Department of State. And I work in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. So sport and human rights is a really important issue to us. Um, I will say that um, the issue of human rights in sporting events really started to become um, of concern to, to our Bureau in 2008 with the Beijing Paralympics um, because of what the Bureau knew about um, human rights issues in China uh, more broadly. So they began to focus. This was obviously prior to my start. I've been in my position since January 3rd, um, but I'm, I'm not new to this work. I um, have contributed to it uh, in the past um, while in the Bureau. But um, I think it's important, and you really um, already highlighted the, the elevation, the visibility of these issues um, since Beijing 2008, and then um, leading on to Sochi in 2014, and then the World Cup in 2018, and with the Beijing Winter Games, and then the, the FIFA World Cup in Qatar. So we asked ourselves what we could do to help address these issues um, at the department within, you know, within our remit, within what we're responsible for. And we worked with um, the government of Switzerland and the International Business and Human Rights um, and John Ruggi um, to figure out a way to begin to um, you know, not just surface the issues, but figure out how to address them. And that's how the Center for Sport and Human Rights really came about, was because there was a need. Um, and several governments and other entities were stepping up and saying, this is really concerning, and it's really antith antithetical to the games and, and what the games represent and the World Cup represent. So um, just to give you an example of my portfolio and, and what I'm looking at, um, certainly promoting the sporting chance principles, um, the importance of um, both modeling and, and um, requiring best practices in human rights and sport is really important. We've seen through the work of others um, the development of the FIFA um, human rights requirements in the bid process, and the International Olympic Committee has developed a strategic um, human rights plan, and their, their human rights requirements have become more stringent um, than they were. Um, they, were, they were focused on envir the environment and gender equity, um, but they've expanded that. Um, and it, it, anyway, it's, it's interesting, and, and all of that has come about because of the interest and pressure of people like you and Nina and many others who've been working on these issues. Um, what we're able to do at the department is really be a convener of, of government, of civil society and of business and the private sector um, on these issues. And sometimes that really can serve us well. I think we saw that really um, in action with the development of the Center for Sport and Human Rights. Uh, we serve on the advisory council of the center um, and have um, really um, typical engagement with them. Um, when, we, when we read about the Visit Saudi um, sponsorship, for example, I reached out to the center to you know, hear what they knew about it and, and to get information. So they're a great resource, and certainly anybody can do that. Um, they have great resources on their website, too. Um, uh, the FIFA uh, World Cup, the 2026 World Cup, is an area that I'm focused on as well. Even though the games are happening in the US, China and Mexico are co-hosting with us, so we have opportunities for bilateral engagement on human rights. 
sharing of best practices um, as an example. Um, and, and um, you know, with the co-hosting of the games, we've seen some interesting developments, um, particularly with Mexico. Um, so I, I can share about those a little bit more um, later on. Uh, but there are opportunities for us as well because we have uh, worker rights issues and, and, and child rights issues with migrant children, um, if you read the New York Times article. Um, so things that we, that we really need to be um, out front about. And I say that because we, we should not be and, and don't really speak with authority on these issues. Uh, we have to recognize that these things happen in the US and we may not be aware of them always necessarily, but um, it's really important to, to articulate that. And, and we, we do that in our relationship with Qatar as well. We have, um, uh, we have, a, we have a, a letter of intent with Qatar, which was really built on the, on the most recent World Cup because we're the follow-on host um, to, again, share best practices, work on areas where you know, either country is weaker and the other can provide resources and guidance um, to strengthen um, you know, really deterring trafficking and, and improving worker rights and those kinds of things. But also, we're interested in learning from them about the types of policies and practices they put in place around accessibility for persons with disabilities, because they were the first World Cup to, to do some things differently so that people with different types of disabilities beyond physical disabilities um, could participate. Um, so just as an example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see. I think those are the main points that I wanted to make at the start. Okay. Sure. Great. I don't know how much uh, you know about the organization I work for, International Labor Organization. Just very quickly, it is the arguably the oldest uh, agency that's a part of the UN system right now. The Universal Postal Union and the International Telecommunications Union precedes us, but nonetheless. Uh, we come out of the Treaty of Versailles, so alongside the League of Nations and the International Court of Justice. The ILO came about in a time when there were no rules of the road for the modern capitalist economy uh, because there were many other competing models at that time. So our job is to build uh, the rules of the road and not as uh, bureaucrats ourselves, but uh, through a tripartite approach, which has workers, employers, and governments sitting together as equals deciding this. So it's not unusual to have Coca-Cola, Disney, Walmart sitting at the table negotiating discussions about violence and harassment at work or global supply chains. And it's a unique place because work is that intersection between the social and the economic. So it's something that's very special to us. Uh, labor rights are human rights. Uh, Mary Robinson, who I've had the uh, fortune to work with many times, told me that uh, towards the end of Eleanor Roosevelt's life, she had the chance to meet her. And Eleanor, as the uh, chair of the Human Rights Co of the Commission, to develop the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, use the ILO's constitution as the foundational document to develop the UDHR. So every right enumerated in that document is there. So I want you to think about labor rights as human rights because it does, uh, labor are people who work, and even employers work as well too. Um, you know, sports can be a really important means of galvanizing people and promoting strength for universal respect for human rights. Um, Kofi Annan often used to talk about with the MDGs uh, how it was so difficult to get people excited about clean water or about uh, you know good environment and so. And he said, well, why can't people look at the MDGs like they do the World Cup where they come together and they really support their teams? We roll forward and we look at what we see today and we realize that it's not such an easy analogy to do. Um, but it is also a place to combat discrimination, and I think we're seeing that through a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of the Premier Leagues, uh, when they're starting, you know, people will take a knee, people will uh, have messaging. So, so I think it is a place where people come together and you can actually reach out to people. Um, we do know that, uh, that mega sporting events do create uh, problems because there are great profits. I think uh, some of the figures now are saying that uh, Qatar or Qatar has generated um, $17 billion in revenue, which is about 10% of their GDP per annum. Uh, and FIFA generated 7.5 billion in uh, advertisements and other rights as well. So there is a great deal of incentive uh, to put on a good show, um, but like anyone knows that behind the curtain, a lot of things happen that we are not very proud of. Um, 
for the ILO, we realize that there are abusive conditions of work, there is contract substitution, there are recruitment fees and hiring which create vulnerability amongst migrant workers. Um, there's wage theft, violence and harassment, squalid living conditions. We've seen all of these things. But the ILO uh, engages on, on this matter uh, through our tripartite structure. Um, the corruption doesn't stop only with uh, certain elements, uh, for example, the International Trade Union Confederation, which is one of the uh, organizations that put forward the complaint that set in motion the ILO's work in Qatar. It wasn't the awarding of the uh, of the World Cup um, that motivated the ILO to do it, but the trade unions, as one of the tripartite partners, put a complaint against uh, Qatar uh, for abusive practices against one of the conventions. In the ILO, we have conventions. And if you ratify that convention, you must actually uh, report every year on what you're doing to give realization to those rights. The BWI and the ITUC came out and said, you're, again, you're, you're uh, val invalidating a lot of the provisions in these uh, conventions. It was uh, Convention uh, 29, which is on forced labor, and that's why it went before the ILO. I can talk a little more about the mechanics of all that, but just to say that for the ILO, um, you know, we do support the sports, uh, Center for Sports and Human Rights, um, and uh, we also help to ensure that human rights and labor rights are embedded within the process. Um, when we talk about the UN guiding principles, and by the way, John Ruggie was my dean at SIPA, so uh, we do have some uh, bona fides there. Good thing you left, because otherwise the guiding principles wouldn't exist. That's right. And, but if you look at Chapter 12, or Section 12 of the, universe, of the um, UN guiding principles, you will see that for the purpose of this document, that the uh, fundamental rights are the ILO's fundamental principles and rights at work. Um, so we are actually very well in the middle of that. And as I said, the UDHR is also uh, an animation of the ILO spirit as well. And many of the other uh, rules that are governing these rights are also coming from the ILO itself. Um, but there are a number of these uh, sort of constructs that actually help us look at human rights and to assess how countries are faring on this and help us to identify and mitigate those risks that come up. Um, the ILO has been partnering with the International Organ um, uh, Olympic Committee for many years. Uh, you may remember, some of you are maybe too young, the Sialkut uh, football controversy, where children in Pakistan were sowing footballs. We also were in Brazil during this, uh, the uh, World Cup with the red card against child labor, a very visual kind of awareness raising uh, uh, element as well too. Um, and we are promoting workers' rights, freedom of association, freedom of speech, and of course, uh, against financial corruption. Um, in addition to that, the ILO has uh, um, conducted a, a number of due diligence um, uh, missions uh, to look at fundamental rights in the workplace, uh, not for mega sporting events only, but when uh, member states themselves uh, are looking uh, to have maybe a negotiating point in trade. So, for example, in trade today, you have in USMCA labor provisions. In the IPEF uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, you're looking at labor rights. So I think in many ways, you know, the ILO plays a central role to, um, to looking at the rights in the workplace, and mega sporting events actually does provide a wonderful opportunity to do that. So I'll stop there and continue later. Fantastic. Thank you. Because that gave us, uh, I'm, I don't think we've had uh, someone speaking so eloquently about labor provisions in, in at, 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 at sites in a while, so I'm very happy to have had the, um, the head of the ILO office lay it out on us. You all have been fighting this fight for a long time, so that's um, very important. Um, so you were talking, uh, Anne, I just have mm -hmm. a, a few questions about, um, you, you talked about this pre predates you at the State Department, but we know of, from your colleagues the kind of what kind of pressures uh, could a, a state like the U.S. Uh, bring to bear using leverage, using the buggy expression, using the leverage of the State Department on um, what was going on in the Sochi and, and Beijing Olympics? Because ironically, mega sporting events are supposed to bring us together. Uh, however, uh, sometimes there are tensions that are created mm -hmm. when you do these sporting events in difficult countries. So, um, you know, how do you, how as someone who, is, who works in the government, and how do your colleagues deal with something like that? And and can you, what are the different levers of pressure? Is it the sponsors? Is it mm -hmm. the clubs? How, how do you do that? 
Yeah, there's, yeah, a, there's a, a, number, easy. a number of answers, okay. but I will start with, um, so we have human rights officers in our embassies around the world, and the human rights officers in embassies where, you know, countries are hosting the games, which usually is in capital, um, may not always necessarily be, but they're there paying attention to their normal human rights issues and perhaps seeing an uptick if there are concerns, human rights concerns around the games, but paying attention to those. Um, and if they're not, then we, you know, get in touch with them and, and let them know what we're hearing, what we're seeing, what we're concerned about, and figure out ways to really have those quiet diplomacy <laughs> conversations, right, um, between those human rights officers and their counterparts, and elevating it, if necessary, um, to higher level, you know, se higher level senior officials when they're traveling. Mm -hmm. So our assistant secretary for democracy and human rights travels. Um, and just as an example, um, if she was traveling to China prior to them hosting um, the Winter Games, then we would give her, you know, talking points um, to discuss the issue or any concerns or things that could be um, discussed um, with them. Um, we, it would be more strategic than that, not that, you know, not as simple as I'm, I'm describing it, but that's one way. Um, so on that point, do you mm -hmm. decide the level of delegation? Because sometimes you say, I'm not going to bring out the big guns because yeah. we yeah, don't and want to show mm -hmm. that we're totally filled with them. Um, yeah, that's a good question. What I, and what I was just talking about was just a, a, a trip by our assistant secretary right. to, to Beijing, not for the games, right. but for other conversations. But in terms of delegations, so the U.S. Um, typically sends a formal delegation to the Olympic and Paralympic Games, both summer and winter, and to the World Cup. Um, there may be a couple of others, Special Olympics, World Games, they usually send mm -hmm. a delegation. So the level of delegation really reflects it sends a signal, the, right. yeah, and it reflects what the priorities are, you know, for that particular administration, right? If the president and first lady go, um, that's an important. Um, if it's, a, you know, if it's a cabinet, m cabinet person, cabinet yeah. member who's in a less senior um, cabinet position, then there's, that communicates something different. I think what you're alluding to perhaps too is Sochi 2014 when yeah. the um, Obama administration sent a delegation of um, U.S. very successful athletes and activists on LGBTQI plus rights to make a point <laughs> about the um, situation of, of LGBTQI plus persons um, and their experiences in, in Russia. Well, thank you, because, mm -hmm. and, and who makes, is that DRL that makes the decision as to what level of delegation, where is that? It's you, uh, the decision is made at the White House, mm -hmm. but they will reach out to different entities to uh, understand who are the best candidates, like who does it make sense mm -hmm. to identify, you know, to invite on the delegation, and that will depend, so we also have a sports diplomacy division in our Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. Uh -huh. um, and I'll talk about them a little bit too because there's sort of the, the diplomacy <laughs> side of things, the public diplomacy mm -hmm. side, which they do. Mm -hmm. So they're often trying to do programming in advance of a World Cup or a Games to really bring people together, right? To learn about our shared, um, our cultures, not our shared cultures, but our cultures and interests and through sport is a great way. Um, so, so they're doing that while we're having the tough conversations, right, <laughs> about these other things. Um, but the delegation decision is ultimately made at the White House, again with outreach and 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 you know input from those of us who understand the, the context of the issue. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get to Kevin in a second, but I wanted to continue on this whole idea. Talk a lot about soft power at, at SICE. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, sports and human rights is very much represented of soft power. Sports is. And it, it, it gives countries a chance uh, to put forward a vision of what they consider themselves as a country that they mm -hmm. reflect. So, uh, and that would include the Paralympics, too. Mm -hmm. um, so, maybe we can uh, talk about some of the, you know, if you could comment on. What that means now that you've been you were associated with not a game, mm -hmm. but now getting involved with USMCA as well, sort of. And I'm glad you brought up about right. We have to lead by example. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes yeah. examples not perfect, 
So, mm -hmm. you know, how, how do you do that? And can, self, can it be a strength of self-power to say, mm -hmm. we're not perfect, mm -hmm. but this is what we're doing? Yeah, absolutely. It absolutely is. I mean, I, I've found it to be, just as an example, disability rights. We have 50 years of experience implementing and, and enforcing rights, and we know what's worked and what hasn't worked. And we share that with our, you know, our counterparts in other countries who are just beginning to um, establish national anti-discrimination laws around disability. But I find that it's more, it's more effective to say, you know, we tried segregated education in this country, um, but we've been doing inclusive education for many, many years now, many decades, and this is, you know, this is what we know works. So. Um, ex admitting that we've made mistakes and perhaps even um, shared <laughs> models that were not appropriate, which is why other countries are, are, you know, investing in segregated education perhaps is important to admit to and help them understand. And that we're coming from a place of, well, here's what worked and what didn't work, you know, recognizing right. different contexts, but yeah, but really don't waste your time um, doing this the wrong way. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, as you can tell, there's a so but Kevin, uh, we're going to get into the gritty of the okay? And uh, if you could talk a little bit about the labor challenges in Qatar, and if you could explain sort of the issues with the kafala system, which was sort of the, the, the base of the origin of these, of, of the challenges. Of uh, the creation of the stadium and um, and the whole infrastructure uh, in uh, in Qatar, um, how does it how does it work and why is it why did this exacerbate the problem the usual problems of creating infrastructure in these host countries? I mean, the the ILO has a unique uh, entry point here uh, for this story. Um, the World Cup did give visibility to these issues. I think it was in the media. I mean, we see that in other places in Uzbekistan. We've seen it before in Cambodia. We see it in other countries around the world as well. Um, uh, but it, uh, the ILO already has a process that is going on in the background. As I mentioned, because we are a normative agency, we create these conventions. Once a country signs that convention, they have an obligation. So uh, Qatar, which uh, became a member of the ILO in the 1970s, signed a number of conventions. Only signed uh, six of them. Um, I think it's a few more. Well, than the, the US, U.S. has actually yeah. signed fewer. It, so. it has indeed. Uh, <laughs> I think only three. That's that's uh, our next discussion. Um, right. <laughs> but I think here what happened is that, um, as I mentioned, the uh, International Trade Union Confederation and the Builders and Woodworkers Union had put a a uh, complaint against Qatar uh, in 2013 to our governing body. That was not resolved, so in 2014, the ILO's um, uh, International Labor Conference received a complaint uh, from BWI and ITUC accusing Qatar of not living up to the provisions of uh, our two conventions, one on forced labor, Convention uh, 30, and then labor inspection. I got the number of that, but uh, we move on. Um, this complaint comes out underneath the ILO's constitution. Uh, in that constitution, uh, Article 26, it says that you can look at noncompliance to these, uh, to these um, um, conventions, uh, and that's what the, uh, that was why the ILO got involved. Um, at the heart of these complaints was the kafala system. Mm -hmm. So the kafala system was resulting in the exploitation of migrant workers, and that inspection systems and complaint systems in the country were not adequately working. Um, basically, what you had is that in the kafala system, you have to actually, you know, you're almost indentured to the employer. You have to actually get a certificate if you want to leave that employment. And when you leave, you have to exit the country. So the techniques that are used are withholding pay, not providing that certification, or maybe even denouncing the migrant workers, saying that they had stolen from you or they absconded with something, right? So or withholding this, their passport. And yeah. withholding passport, which is classic right. forced labor in, in terms of the ILO's definition. Um, so in terms of that, the ILO then... Uh, you know, was on the ground. Uh, we have a commission of inquiry that went into country that looked at this. It came back to Qatar and said, look, these are the problems that we see. Um, so this triggered a series of responses from the ILO supervisory mechanism. What people don't understand is that the UN, when they do create these sort of international norms, there is no enforcement mechanism by and large. The ILO does. The ILO has teeth. 
maybe it's more gumming, uh, but it certainly <laughs> has teeth. And we have a, a sort of a, our nuclear option is going to the International Court of Justice. I don't know many people that actually know that, but if at the end the country does not respond to the ILO's overtures uh, and, to the, um, and to the findings, um, we've not yet faced that, although we may face that in Venezuela, which is a complaint brought yeah. by the employers. Interesting. Um, so this had triggered the ILO's governing body to send this mission. They came back with their, repo with their report. Finally, the state of Qatar had agreed on the UN's program for action, and we laid it out. So what was it? The complaint was on non-observance, so they put in place Law 21, which looks at it relating to the entry, exit, and resident of migrant mm -hmm. workers. It also responded to Law 15, uh, which is on domestic workers. I mean, another uh, sort of um, uh, put-upon group as well, too, which was one of the first things that had to be done before the ILO would even engage in Qatar, is that it had to do something for migrant workers. And then it was also on the enacting the labor reform. So there was a prescriptive step of five things that Qatar had to do uh, for this. And five months after that agreement had been struck, in April of 2018, the ILO had opened an office in uh, Doha to implement the program of action. Um, I mean, I can go through some of the things. I don't know if, we, if you don't mind me doing this. But well, in, 20, yeah. in 2017, uh, the law regulating employment for domestic workers was adopted. This was the key in getting the ILO involved. 2018, when we already established the office, a dispute resolution committees uh, came into being. Those are the labor courts. They didn't exist before. right? It was the employers making all the decisions mm. themselves. In addition to that, worker support and insurance fund was established. And since that time, $350 million was paid to workers. So looking at back wages or wage theft mm -hmm. or, or, or shaving of the wages themselves. And the Qatar visa centers. Anyone who works in labor migration know that when people travel to go to work overseas, there's a big giddiness about going overseas and earning money and remitting those funds back to your family and so. But it is not a good experience for a lot of domestic workers or other workers who go overseas. So having these, uh, these visa centers were very important to ensure that people were being onboarded, knew their rights, knew what their accommodations were, knowing what their contract had, had allowed them, so it was very important. In 2019, the kafala reforms, the exit reform was done. So that required an exit permit. That had been removed. Kafala has not been dissolved, but certain provisions have been. Uh, we also, in, um, in uh, 2019, uh, there were worker representatives elected to joint committees. These joint committees are in 70 enterprises with 50,000 workers, and we've delivered training modules uh, every year, and there is a hospitality sector committee. So anyone in hospitality is covered by this committee, and they can have a voice, they can bring a complaint, and that can be then addressed to the government. In 2020, kafala reforms on labor mobility. So this means that when you leave yeah. a job, before the employer would say, you can't leave the job. Right. So in this case, it was to say that you can actually quit the job and then take a job. And that's good for employers, because then yep. you don't have to recruit people coming into the country. But you also have to make sure their rights are there. I'll just close with 2021, the non-discriminatory minimum wage. Very important. So this is both for women and for men, uh, women in domestic work, or in mostly and sometimes in construction, but not very much. It's mostly men in that. Um, and this also included a minimum basic wage, a food allowance, and also on uh, accommodation allowance. 280,000 workers' wages have been increased. 81% of the wages from these low-wage workers actually get sent back home. So they don't really have a lot of operating cash, so they need to make sure that their accommodations and food are taken care of. And the minimum wage commission was established. It never existed before, wow. so now it is out there. Uh, also, new legislation to protect outdoor workers from heat stress. Anybody who has worked in the field of agriculture will realize that heat stress, renal failure, this is claiming lives all over the world. And there are a number of um, uh, provisions there. Reduced exposure, four weeks during the summer, you're not allowed out between certain times of the day because of the heat. All work will stop during the wet bulb globe temperature, a new term that I found out today, uh, at 32.1. So that's up at around 90 degrees. So when it hits 90 degrees, you can't work outside, right? Because wow. that can okay. kill you. Um, financial losses due to heat stress reaches about 2.4 trillion a year. And that's also linked to climate change as well, too. So we can't say this is an absence. And then uh, in 2022, inspectors shut down 463 work sites because of that heat stress as well, mm -hmm. too. Um, so th and then lastly, to say the standard employment contract for domestic workers was amended. So it allowed 
uh, domestic workers to leave the employment. A lot of people who hire domestic workers in their household, it's a very odd sort of thing because some people feel that they know all the secrets of the family, right? Because you're there, you're taking care of the kids, you're looking after grandma, you're going for the food, you're preparing the, the bed chambers. I mean, so your intimate part, but you're not the family. Mm -hmm. Anybody who tells you they're family, it's not true. You're a worker. You are there to earn a salary, and that's what you are there for. So amending that law to say that domestic workers could also change jobs and move in households as well, too. So those are the main deliverables that the ILO has put in place since we started the office there in 2018. Wow, okay. So I don't know how many, how many of you actually were aware that so much of this had been put in place uh, since uh, in the last, what, five years? Yeah. Okay, so some people, there's some ringers in the audience, but, anyway. <laughs> um, but still, I, I think that, um, you know, that uh, may, makes me feel a little bit better <laughs> in, 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 it does not assuage the entire guilt because we still have 6,500 people, migrant workers who died uh, creating uh, this infrastructure, but uh, that it wasn't all in vain, perhaps, because things, um, things have improved. Hopefully there's not going to be backsliding now that the focus from the World Cup uh, is gone, and uh, but there is the ILO office in there who would uh, will give us sort of the the red light if things start backsliding. Hopefully, that's what we're there for. Uh, there, you're okay, <laughs> and and so um, I think that's extremely important. Now, I wanted to um, I wanted to ask Anne. Uh, let's get into the nitty gritty. Then I'm going to uh, move to uh, Aditya. Um, um, Mizra, who is going to make some comments uh, um, af after uh, Anna said a few words on, like the nitty. There's a nitty gritty question um, that has come up now, uh, the um, from a U.S. government point of view, mm -hmm. and you might not. It's a tough one. Okay, <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, so I'm, I've been part, and 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 Josh and and Jonathan and a number of other people here know that the U.S. is going through. Um, in overview, review of its National Action Plan on Responsible Business Conduct. And the former uh, Assistant Secretary on Business, uh, on um, uh, DRL uh, at State, um, Mike Posner, uh, has written a very interesting article in Forbes and, and, wor and working with us, uh, saying that the U.S. has to be consistent on responsible business conduct. The U.S. needs to apply its uh, regulations ac uh, according to federal acquisition regulations when it's doing business abroad with other countries. So, for example, um, the U.S. government now is expanding, is working with the Qataris to expand and modernize the airport in Qatar, the air base, sorry, not the, the air base. Um, and therefore, um, they are hiring worker, migrant workers to do this. Will the U.S. government be uh, insisting on the reimbursement of recruitment fees for these workers now um, or not? Because I think now we've moved to, there are a lot of these good points have been made, but recruitment fees is still out there, right? So the reimbursement of recruitment fees is huge because, as you were saying, Kevin, that this means that a lot of these, uh, these workers are working almost a year or two in a situation of indentured servitude to pay back the recruitment fees, which includes travel, visa, whatever else that the recruiters add on, for them just to get out of, of, of a hole, which for them is a massive hole, right? So um, is there any chance that the, the U.S. In, in its overview of, uh, in its review of the National Action Plan, will that happen, do you think? Sorry to put you on the spot there. I know. I love <laughs> I love how you did that. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I, I had a little bit of warning um, that this was coming, um, and I don't. I don't really have an answer. Um, but this is an example of asking tough questions of yeah. government about um, what they're going to do about certain issues. I mean, what I'm going to be able to do is raise this with my colleague who's mm -hmm. working on the national action plan. Um, you know, from the democracy and human rights perspective about, about this. Years. So, I mean, it's, it's on our team, but obviously Scott's our senior official um, overseeing the and work Josh that we do. Like so, <laughs> yeah, so I don't, I don't really don't know the mm -hmm. answer. I mean, I, I did a little mm -hmm. bit of research to understand the issues better, but that's, that's going to require more uh, conversations and research on our end. But like I said, I think this is 
this really elevates the issue, right, to uh, conversations that I now need to have with people who are working on the National Action Plan. So this is a great example of a way to... Uh, yeah, this is the whole of government approach mm -hmm. that we've been trying to advocate with a National Action Plan. So this is a, a small but important example. Um, okay, Aditya. So, um, Aditya, if you if you don't have to take pictures now while you're working, but I, I wanted to um, to give the floor a little bit to uh, Aditya, who's a second year um, mayor student here, focusing on development economics and policy in South Asia studies. I found out uh, that he, you know, he's in my uh, he's in my class on corporate sustainability and business and human rights, and I was. Delighted to find out, and this was a total surprise, that he had done a podcast, uh, when was it, a few months ago? When was it? In, in November, um, uh, on, the, uh, on, the gay, on the World Cup and raising some issues that he had um, with, uh, with the game and the human rights issues. He uh, has a strong interest uh, and background in film and video production, as you can tell and um, hoping to drive insight and understanding in international communities and experiences at the intersection of development and media. And you were in Bologna, you were in Bologna last year, so totally into uh, calcio, soccer. Um, hopefully the Bologna students will be watching this, um, this broadcast at some point. Uh, and um, so you're gonna, and you're gonna be doing a second podcast on this issue based on what you've learned uh, since then. So if you could, Share with us what brought you to making a podcast of this nature. You all have to watch it, and maybe we can push that out at some point. But um, why did, what, what brought you to doing a podcast on this issue? Sure. Is, is this yeah, it's okay? Yeah, working. To, um, yeah, first of all, thank you to, um, to Maya and The Observer for the continued support um, with, uh, with this type of content. Um, and thank you to Professor Gardner for advocating my work in the interest of addressing broader human rights issues. Um, so I think for me, um, sports has always been a major influential part of my life. And I think growing up, uh, a lot of the mentorship and the guidance and the connections that I made through sports were very impactful for me. Uh, and I think um, it really was the first thing that I really cared about. And I think a lot of the qualities that I got um, from sports, uh, I wanted to implement in my future professional and academic life. Um, so that was a big part of my, of my upbringing. Um, I think uh, growing up, um, my family and I moved to the US in 2002 and I was around 10. And so cricket was actually my first real love as a sport. Um, and um, growing up in India, uh, in our my, my primary years, um, it's something that's so imbued in Indian culture and society. Um, and so I was a big cricket fan growing up. And what I also thought was interesting is that cricket is a British game. And so um, it's one of many things that have been taken from um, kind of imperialist culture um, and, and lasted. So I thought those were really interesting. and. That took me into the um, the World Cup in South Africa in 2010, which is um, just the sport is is that much more international. The scope of the game is is so much more. I think there are three to four billion viewers um, across the world, and so um, I think it was a really notable tournament. Um, you know, we uh, the, the favorites Brazil were, were knocked out in in the quarterfinals and. Uh, it was the first year that Spain won the World Cup, so it was, it was really it was really special, and I think it was also a major turning point for the FIFA elections because uh, Sepp Blatter, who is the uh, the leader, actually promised that he would bring the World Cup to Africa, and that was a big turning point in him winning the election. Um, so ultimately, um, all these kind of international uh, exposures about sports and culture were in my mind, and I. Got to do a study abroad in in UK in the London in, in London, um, and I um, was two tube stops away from the most one of the most storied um, footballing sides, Arsenal. And I'm become a big a big Arsenal fan, and I'm I'm hopeful that we can win the season this year. But um, I I don't think we we will because I think that we're seeing the game change a lot, and we're seeing teams like uh, Manchester City and Chelsea. Um, with um, you know, 
new owners, um, Chelsea has a new American owner, um, the, we're really seeing the impact of, of money in the game. And um, I think uh, as we look at Newcastle United, who were bought um, by Saudi owners, um, and now they're the richest club in the world at over $300 billion US, um, you're really seeing some of these changes in the club game. And uh, there's also a Qatari bid to buy Manchester United. So with, you know, when you have Qatari and Saudi ownership in these big clubs, you know, what does that mean for the game? What does that mean for UK um, and Saudi and Qatari relations? So I think these were some of the factors that I wanted to discuss in my video. Um, and I think there are many issues with the World Cup, uh, with uh, the injuries, uh, because it was held in November, um, with the heat, with the poor treatment of migrant workers. Um, there are um, a number of reasons that this tournament has, has stood out. And so it's a particularly interesting yet disheartening case study. Um, so those are some of the factors that I considered in my, in my work. And I guess maybe um, I could start with a couple of questions and then we can open up. Yeah, we'll open um, up for questions. So get your questions ready, folks. Um, so I guess my first question is, um, what is a counterfactual? And I think there's been a lot of attention about the human rights in issues in Qatar. But I think these breaches happen with other tournaments in Russia and in Brazil and in South Africa. So um, these tournaments wouldn't happen at all if we you know, fully ex exercise the extreme of human rights breaches. So question one is, how do we discuss those things? And question two is, I think football is followed much more in the Western context. Of course, there's following in, in South, a South America and in Africa. But um, Western critics have been very critical about um, human rights issues in the Middle East and in Qatar. But I think their own histories um, paint a different side. So maybe how should Western countries approach this narrative uh, with Qatar? Thank you. Easy questions. You want to start, Anne? <laughs> um, thank you very much. Yeah. I mean, again, coming from the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, we, you know, we want these human rights abuses to be discussed. We're eager to discuss the concerns that we have with, with countries when we have bilateral meetings and that we have bilateral human rights dialogues with, for example. Um, and so whenever a country is willing to have conversations about human rights, we, we want to do that. Um, I, think, um, <clears throat> I think elevating these issues and having pub more public awareness and conversations about them is going to make it easier to really have these discussions more broadly beyond the, um, you know, the quiet diplomacy meetings that I mentioned before. Um, the, uh, regarding Western countries and, and our contributions to the human rights abuses, um, we have to, um, you know, we have to really be self-critical and analyze those and, and be willing to talk about those or at least recognize that they're going to be um, surfaced and elevated in exchange for issues that we elevate, um, which we see in the Human Rights Council and in the UN. Um, it, it, it's you're sitting on the human rights, you're, you're Yeah, the US is a member of the Human Rights Council. In, yeah. In your portfolio. Yes, yes, that's right. Um, I'll leave it there. Okay. Just maybe to follow on a bit, I mean, from the ILO's perspective, I mean, again, we are from a rights-based institution. We, we work a lot with uh, financial institutions like the World Bank and the IMF and the IFC. We speak different languages. Um, you know, it's important to use all the levers of power that you can in order to constrain the bad actors. I think that's happening, due diligence laws in the EU and the like, and, uh, and I think now with the Biden administration's worker-centric approach, I would have to commend them. You know, I mean, the, the, the words are there. The strategies are there, and I'm very excited about that. Um, but these mega sporting events only amplify what's happening behind the scenes. So you may have greater focus on these issues, but they're happening all the time. I mean, you can't open the newspaper in the U.S. even and find what was it the uh, the meat processing plant with child labor is being used. You have the Bloom and Onion, uh, you know, situation down in um, in Georgia perpetrated by a, a government official who is 
using people as uh, as indentured servants, uh, human trafficking issues as well too. Uh, but this happens around the world. Um, so I do think that having these these conversations out loud, I think really calling it out is quite important. Um, and it shouldn't be only driven by money, because I think the issue at the end of the day is that you know when you treat people well, and, and here's my ILO pitch, of course, too, <laughs> is that you know all businesses need talent. Right? And many people here today will probably only want to work for a company that they admire, right? if not start your own company. And I think you should demand that of companies moving forward. You know, uh, companies are legal constructs. Uh, they are put together by people. Um, we believe in a uh, stakeholder approach, not a not a, uh, a shareholder approach, because you as a worker are contributing your skills, your talent, your energy, and your industry towards that as well, too. The mega sporting events are just, again, amplifying those things that happen in the background. Um, in terms of the, uh, the West being critical of the global South or of other developing countries as well, it is there. I, I think a lot of problems that we see around the world, whether it's forced labor, uh, child labor, this is driven by poverty. The reason people are moving, you know, leaving your country, and my grandparents on both sides of my family came to the United States back in the 1920s. My grandmothers were uh, basically, uh, they were indentured servants. They had to work for a wealthy family for a few years to pay off their passage. I have a sense of that in my family history, but not like people are experiencing today. People today are experiencing some of the worst forms of abuse and sometimes even commercial sexual exploitation. Um, so you have to walk the walk and talk the talk. Um, but it does exist behind the scenes. Having strong institutions, having people have a voice, right? Because you're at an asymmetrical power relationship if you're a worker. If you don't have a committee to rely upon or somebody to help you with that, you can be targeted. Um, but also just, you know, since we are speaking about Qatar as well too, I mean, I will give the government a great deal of credit. They have done things that have happened very quickly. We've seen this in Uzbekistan, for example, those who've been following you know, forced labor in the cotton growing sector, forced and child labor in, in uh, Uzbekistan for years. I mean, we were brought in at a point in time uh, about eight years ago, and in seven years we brought the 2.3 million uh, forced and child laborers down to less than 1,000. That took political will, civil society engagement, media Massive attention. Massive boycott. Well, the boy yes. see, boycotts sometimes have a negative effect. They have a negative externality on those they're meant to help. Mm -hmm. Because right now, Uzbekistan is receiving back because uh, Russia is not into the SWIFT system. So one million migrants are returning, um, uh, Uzbekis from Russia. They're coming back to an environment where there's no work for them. And many of the companies that were on the boycott, the 365 companies that were on the boycott, have decided they're not going to invest in, in Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan has logistical and systemic problems. It is a landlocked country. You can't get your products out. It costs a lot more. You know, Xinjiang is next door, but then there are all the issues and the WROs, the withhold and release orders at a CDP, which are not allowing that cotton to come in. So all it is to say is that when you look at global supply chains, and the ILO has a, a program which is called Better Work, which works at the factory level to kind of work with the businesses to show, hey, if you treat your workers well, they're more productive. They're more, you know, they're, they stay longer for your company. Um, and you can build your market based upon the fact that you've got good products, good clean products. So I, I think the idea is that, yes, it has been easy to point fingers at the global south for the problems that have been created in their own countries. But I think we have enough examples here to see that as well. So the rule of law, which has been slowly whittled away in many situations, unfortunately needs to be strengthened. And it's not to say that it constrains uh, companies to operate. If you look at Germany, which actually has workers sitting on their boards, they're a very competitive country. All the Scandinavian countries, they do very well as well, too. They have you know, good uh, laws in place. So it is possible. And today, I think people are realizing that you know, using child labor or using forced labor is not a comparative advantage. It, because first of all, the productivity is not there. And also, when the, when the world becomes involved in that, I, I see it normally in Europe and in, in Canada, they have a greater sense of social justice, um, that they don't buy goods from companies that are breaking the law. Here, we're at price point. If it's cheap, we'll get it, right? But we don't know what that supply chain, and almost every supply chain is different, but there's not one or two layers. There are hundreds of layers, if not thousands of layers of suppliers in global supply chains. So all the cement that built those stadiums, all the steel that went in there, all the buses that had gone, all the shirts that were made, all, all of the you know, uniforms. I mean, it's, it is a massive undertaking, but I think we have to agree on the rules of the road, and that's why the ILO was put in place in the first place. Another pitch for my own. Bravo, right. <laughs> Questions? Anyone? Yes. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, really valid points. Um, 
I agree with the fact that we need to have a more open and frank conversation about labor rights and migration rights. However, I felt that in the run-up to the Qatar, uh, Qatar World Cup, there was a lot of discourse that verged on Islamophobic, especially in the Western media. For example, um, there were caricatures in the French press that showed the Qatari national team as terrorists. Uh, there were there were picture captions in the British press that said that Qataris are not used to uh, women dressing up in Western clothes, even though 85% of the population is not from Qatar. So when you have these narratives and when you have this discourse in the mainstream media and it affects the host nation, for example, Qatar, is there a way for uh, labor rights organizations to divert the discourse because when this happens uh, attitudes harden on both sides and becomes much more difficult to affect change um you know i mean it's very difficult because you're doing awareness raising right and you can't always fix people's skewed views on this because maybe it has a political purpose maybe it's because of ignorance uh, or for whatever it might be or or carrying on a narrative that sounds funny when you're in a small group but then when you bring it to, to the public you sound a bit out of out of key. So it does require a lot of information uh, coming uh, from the field. Um, so, for example, you know, we talked about um, the the uh, you know the deaths, right? That comes out of a Guardian article that says yeah. six thousand five hundred yeah. people were killed. But actually, what that what that it did is that it looked at all migrants. It didn't just look at those who were injured uh, in workplace accidents. So it elevated that, right? And it's saying, well, you know, people coming from India and Nepal and uh, you know, who are going there, never worked on a building more than five stories tall because I don't see any of that, right? I mean, we, we know all that's rubbish. But the fact is that those means get perpetrated and, and put into the consciousness. So we do need to have, you know, uh, some information that comes out. Um, we talk about recruitment fees, right? There should be no recruitment fee. No one should pay a recruitment fee because we see from our research that we find that migrant workers are three times more vulnerable to fall into forced labor if they were paying recruitment fees. Right? Because they have to make all this money and then pay back that fee, which a lot of people mortgage their homes, sell their land, just so that somebody would go overseas, get a good job. I mean, the minimum wage right now, I've said that they've set a minimum wage, a non-discriminatory minimum wage, which is 1,000 uh, Qatari real, about $275. Right? But to somebody who comes from a very rural area, that is that is like winning the jackpot. Right? But they're living in squalid conditions for 5, 7, 10, 12 years just so that their family back home will have a good life for themselves. Right? So we have to look at the struggle of the individual as well, too, and get the information out there and be able to correct these situations. Um, and we face pushback. You know, there are a lot of governments that say, well, recruitment fees are important. It's the way that we generate you know, income. And if you were attracting good workers and, and they weren't vulnerable, they would actually contribute more because more money in the pocket of a worker means more goods being sold. Right? I mean, let's just think about economics on this. So, so I, I do think you know what we're talking about is one is what the law says, what the human rights say on that, and then what people do to pejoratize others. And I think we're in that moment now of otherness. Right? It's very easy, and I don't want to get into the politics of it, but we all hear every day about how the others are the problem. They're the ones taking my jobs. They're the ones creating the problems. It is their problem, whether it's LGBTQIA or it may be a, you know foreign nationals coming in. I think we have to stop all of that. How do we do that? It's a little bit beyond what the ILO can do. But I do think and I encourage most other people to work together on those issues. Yeah. Hold on a second. Just because we're recording and capture your thoughts. Thank you. Um, very interesting discussion. I'm, I'm doing the MIPP here at, at SAIS. I'm from Venezuela. Uh, thanks for mentioning the situation. Um, just a comment, and, and I think one of the main challenges for these mega sporting events is that, um, uh, for example, FIFA has more members than the United Nations. Uh, I mean, technically, probably is the, the most powerful international organization in, in the world. And, uh, and we've been having these challenges uh, almost for a century because um, not only with FIFA, but also on the um, uh, International Olympic Committee. In the 1930s, there was an Olympic in Germany where Hitler didn't want to give the gold medal to Jesse Owens. In mm -hmm. the 1970s, there was a World Cup in Argentina where there was a brutal dictatorship of, of, of Fidel. And we're talking here of authoritarian regimes. No is far left, far right. They're human rights um, violators. Uh, we're having Saudi Arabia 
bidding for the 2030 World Cup, which I think they have a pretty good chance to be to win that, right? Because they're not doing it alone. They're doing, I think, they're bidding also with Greece, and I can remember another Egypt and Egypt exactly. So well, that that was a very smart yeah. way to because it's not so. Is there a way that uh, uh, the FIFA and the International Olympic um, Committee could maybe uh, put some restrictions of, of, of nations that are members that if you are not committed with human rights or uh, maybe that you, you, you are disqualified, like, like something that is going on right now with the Russian Federation since the invasion started, but the, the last World Cup before Qatar was in Russia, by the way, so you don't need to have an invasion to expel someone from that, so mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. Who wants to take that? I always have something to say, but please. I'm sure, happy to, happy to start. I mean, that's where that that's where my brain goes <laughs> immediately in, in terms of trying to tackle this or, or prevent what we see coming, right, with 2030, and also future Olympic Games. I mean, I, I, you know, the IOC is very interested, and this is my own opinion, not the U.S. government's opinion, but they're very interested in, um, you know having games on every continent or in every region. Um, so if they're presented with a potential of that, um, and I've noted in some of their strategic um, documents around human rights, there is a little bit of squishiness in, in the wording um, in terms of countries um, meeting the human rights responsibilities yeah, as they relate to their games hosting specifically, so not the broader human rights uh, abuses that might be happening in a country that's bidding. Um, so that's one issue. Um, I think what's happening with Belarus and Russia is really interesting, and, and the U.S. Uh, Department of State and several under, other like-minded countries actually issued a statement um, regarding athletes from Belarus and Russia um, and the need for them to be um, sanctioned or restricted from representing those two countries in upcoming games. Um, so it's some, there's a movement afoot to look at that. Um, so there's potentially, you know, that could be a topic of discussion for consideration, I, w I would think. But I don't, you know, I know the FIFA and the IOC probably wouldn't really welcome that. Um, yeah, Kevin, you just, have just a on quick that. response to that. Yeah. To say in 2017, FIFA has introduced robust bidding requirements that now in, embed UN guiding principles in yeah. that. So for any, um, any future World Cup starting in 2026, well, that may not cover some of the ones that are happening now, but that any country or region that wants to host the World Cup has to conduct a human rights risk assessment yep. and outline how they intend to mitigate each of these risks. That is happening. Uh, we were contacted because there was, you know, the State Department is everywhere. So uh, <laughs> we bumped into somebody who was working in the Houston um, uh, City Council who was a former State Department official, and they had to put the bid forward for a World Cup. So they had asked us to advise them on a couple of areas about what would be the responses to address you know, um, human trafficking issues, how to address you know, migrant workers and, uh, and wage theft, and so. So it is possible to be done. As I said, it requires all of you know, government in the sense of the US, but all of society as well. So can the media kind of bring out the messages that doesn't pejoratize or negate the humanity of others, you know, uh, and to see, and this came up in a discussion, it's a bit of a nuance, not to see migrant workers as migrants, but to see them as workers. Yeah. Because that's what they're doing. They're filling a need that is necessary in society. You go talk to the farmers, you know, down south, and you see what problems they're having with migrant workers because they just have no visibility. People don't want to come and work those backbreaking jobs anymore. That's what, it's not the great resignation, it's the great reassessment. People don't want dull, dangerous, and dirty jobs anymore. They're unwilling to put up with it. And that is, I could say, the only good thing that came out of COVID. But I think generally, I think people need to look at the world of work as a way that in which people uh, contribute to society, not only economically, but also socially and culturally as well. And whether it's somebody from the United States or somebody from the global south, I think you know we all have the same objective. We want to do well for ourselves and for our families. So I think a rights-based approach to all of this is absolutely necessary. All right, yes, and, and uh, thanks to John Ruggie, I think we've really gotten into in place some of these bench, their human rights benchmarks, so things are going to be benchmark monitored, corrected, um, so future host committees will be looking at that. So it's not going to be uh, laissez-faire, uh, and I have to say, I'll get to your, your question in a second, 
Um, this, the 2026 one uh, Olympics, or no, the FIFA here is going to have a whole bunch of issues because um, it's going to raise not only migrant labor, but what about, um, what about visa uh, asylum issues? Because you're going to have people coming in from Mexico and Latin America to watch these games here. So I, I, that's going to open up a whole other can of worms that I hate to think about. Yeah, last question, then we're going to close up. First off, thank you for joining us and for your work in these issues. I'm just curious what work either of your organizations do with the athletes. I'm thinking of those choosing to go play golf or soccer in Saudi Arabia, <laughs> and if um, you work with them at all or work with other athletes who promote not choosing that option. I think that's for you, Anne. Mm -hmm. I, 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 we're, we're not necessarily working with them, but I know we work closely with the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee. They're a partner of our sports diplomacy work in particular, but we also have talked to them in the past about speaking with the athletes and helping educate them about the human rights situations in countries that they might be competing in. So that's a, something that we are willing to offer um, to the athletes because we think it's really important. If I make just two quick things. The ILO has a representative on sports and human rights. Giovanni De Cola, and he participates. It's probably Italian? Probably Italian. Well, just because uh, FIFA had a FIFA is also Italian. No comment on that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but it is also to say the ILO does work with the athletes. It works with the teams. It works with the management of those teams as well, too, because sports figures are modeling behavior for others. This is another area as well, too, that you can telegraph what is acceptable and what isn't. Those who watch the Premier League, you know, you saw, you know, these kind of pejorative statements made at, at players from around the world on the pitch, right? And then the, then the league got together and they said, we're not going to stand for that, right? So it is possible that you can make those changes and you have to work with the athletes and the teams and the broadcasters and the financiers and everyone involved, the hospitality, you know, the, the transportation. Right? There, there's so many different actors that come into play in this. It's not just, well, if the government doesn't do it, I throw my hands up. We all have a role to play in that. And you also as citizens, right? How many of you didn't watch the World Cup? I refused to watch it. I wanted to because I, I celebrate sports. I, was, I did decathlon when I was younger. I love sports. But you have to make a stand someplace. And if you don't have that red line, if you don't have that boundary for yourself, what's going to change your mind, right? Because don't look to others to change, right? Change yourself as well, too. Wow. OK, well, that's actually a pretty uh, strong uh, close, <laughs> I think, unless you have any other comments. I'll just, uh, we're at time, and I would just say, as you heard in the last uh, hour and 15 minutes, that multi-stakeholder, multi, sorry, mega sporting events, I'm never going to get over this, mega sporting <laughs> events can bring about massive human rights challenges, right? And we've heard that actually putting the focus, as we did in, in Qatar, or Qatar, um, has really helped move the needle, thanks to the ILO and the engagement of many others. Um, and it takes everybody, from governments to civil society, to these tripartite uh, groups like the ILO, um, especially when you're having these events in countries that um, are not used to um, dealing with these issues, mitigating or resolving them, because there's just, uh, you know, it's not in, in it's not a uh, high priority for them. Um, but it seems to be imperative to prevent and confront these abuses um, because otherwise they threaten to undermine the sport's unique power to reconcile differences um, and be a force for good, which is what they are, and they are magnificent for that. So we hope the Olympics and the World Cup will um, remain and they will be stronger because of the changes that they are implementing. And it's up, as you said, Kevin, it's up to all of us to keep their feet to the fire um, and, and, and continue, because we don't want them to go away. And we want to watch with, a, with not a guilty conscience, and we want to make sure that Kevin can watch the next one. So thank you, thank you. very much. <laughs>